tech check. Ooh, you already got the recording going. Okay. So just in case you're new to uh, Blackboard Collaborate or if you wanted a refresher, if you want to check your settings at the bottom right corner of your screen, you should see that little purple, looks like a fingerprint. And if you click on that, it'll give you your gear icon to set up your camera or your microphone that we do not require cameras on. We're very informal. You can also see who's in the session with you. If you go to the participant list, and that's the little people icon. And the last one here is the chat bubble, which we're going to use in just a moment. Well, my name is Megan Holt, and I'm an online teaching coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learn. And I think I've met both of you in the past, but just to give you a little bit of background on me, I started out teaching English composition and then I moved into academic advising and now I work as a staff, as a staff member to support our faculty. So I can give you a little bit of perspective on just about every angle. All right, so um, we are going to do some icebreaker activities here in just a second, um, which is basically our introductions. I have a couple of questions for you, uh, but then we're going to just dive right into the content, which is why do we review or assess courses? What are the quality essentials? Since that is our topic of the workshop. We're going to look at planning or evaluating your course with the quality essentials and then the surprise feature information of things that are coming soon. And of course, we do have a formal Q&A period at the end, but it's just a few of us, so feel free to um, chime in. You can hop on the microphone or you can type in the chat. All right, but I'm going to leave the introductions up here on the screen and you can go ahead and type in the chat here. Uh, but let me know your name, your role, or what is it that you teach. And then I'd like to know just a little bit about you. So how do you assess your course? Or I, I know it says an online course. It's really any course that has a strong digital presence. So if you teach hybrid or you use Blackboard a lot, uh, that's fine as well. And then our other topic is what have you heard about quality essentials? So I'm going to let you type for a couple of moments. I see a few things coming in the chat. I'll let you keep typing just to answer a couple of those questions.
Great, I see some introductions. So Lynette is with ATRA, teaches online ETT 211. And Mary is a clinical assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Do either of you want to come on the microphone? Would that be easier? And you can let us know, you know, how do you currently assess your course or how, what have you heard about quality essentials? Maybe you haven't, I'm not sure. Hi there, this is Mary. Hi. Um, so I, I primarily all teach um, graduate and doctoral courses, which is all online. Um, in the School of Nursing and how I assess my courses um, based on primarily student feedback. So the um, end of the term reports, but then we also do a survey, a midterm survey of how things are going, what's working well, what's what could be improved upon. Um, and I know a little bit about like quality matters and stuff because um, we had a grant with the School of Nursing and there's multiple um, faculty and teachers that took that course, but I unfortunately did not at that time. So did that answer all the questions? <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to give you a pop quiz. I was just kind of curious, but yes, thank you very much. Um, wonderful. So that was actually going to be one of my recommendations today um, in involving student feedback into our assessments. So excellent, glad to hear you already incorporated that into your um, assessment approach. And then Quality Essentials does derive from QM. So we'll, we'll get to see a little bit of that today as well. Okay. Lynette, did you wanna discuss how you? Um, actually, it was very similar. Since I'm only a TA in that course, you know, the um, main instructor, um, puts all the assessments in there. So again, we use the evalu evaluation, just like Mary said. Um, and I'm also familiar with the QM um, standards because in my daytime job, basically, um, I also work for the online department. And so um, we we have instituted um, QM standards and hours. So other than that, like uh, Mary said, we're using the um, evaluations and uh, reflections in the course. Wonderful. Excellent. All right, that gives me a, a good foundation, and it sounds like you already know QM, so I think that'll that'll give you a good preview for quality essentials. Great. So, um, you know, I did kind of approach this a little bit from a maybe a chronological order. I thought before we talk about assessing courses, we need to understand the different types of review processes. So, I came up with four types of course reviews or assessments. I'm using those words interchangeably today. Um, but these are potentially four different scenarios where you might assess in a course. And so the first one comes um, probably is no surprise. It's where you modify or make changes to a course midterm. And I think for many of our faculty members, this is pretty standard. You'll often see in a syllabus or in a schedule um, a little, you know, asterisk that says subject to change. Um, and this could be something as mild as a snow day or a sick day or something like that. But it's also this idea that you are in this low grade of assessment throughout the semester or throughout the term. You might look at your students and determine that maybe there's something they were very interested in. And so you've decided to devote a little bit of extra time to that topic or you might find that your students are struggling to grasp certain concepts. And so you, again, may elect to spend more time on specific things that they need to continue to review. So if that happens, you might have to take away time from other activities. The second one that we have on here is the idea of the end of the course review, uh, where you can revise and make changes for the next course offering. So both of you had discussed that you already incorporate student feedback into your, into your assessment. And so this might be an area where you're going to look at the course reviews and the evaluations from your students. Um, but you're going to take more of a, 
I guess, a summative approach to this, you're, you're taking a step back and you're going to look at things like what worked well, what do I want to continue to do, uh, what are some areas that were a little weak and I could revise it, or you may elect to do a complete overhaul, um, whether that's for the entire course or for an in, just one section. Um, and sometimes overhauls are good too. They, they don't just come out of this need to change. Sometimes even though something is going well, you might want to experiment and try something new. The third one might be a little bit more specific to NIU. I know different institutions have uh, different, different setups, but um, something that we see fairly frequently is that an instructor may inherit a course from somebody who previously taught it, or it might be a new hire who is looking at the previous course information. But um, in any event, they are trying to put their own stamp on the course. And so that's another time where we, we're seeing course revision. And of course, the fourth and final one that we've kind of hinted at is this formal outside review process. And this is where a third party comes in with a agenda or a rubric, and they do a thorough review of all pieces of your course. And this is, again, to ensure quality online teaching. So I think that covers probably the four different types of review. And we can still use Quality Essentials um, for any of those scenarios. So now I do want to hear from you again. And this is one of my favorite questions because it is based on opinion. But how often do you think you should revise your course? And I know you may say, well, it depends. Um, if it would help, maybe we can structure this as if you were going to teach at NIU for 20 years and you knew that this course was yours, how often would you revise it? Well, minor revisions I would do every term, but um, a, a overhaul or a redo do, needs to happen every couple of years, maybe every um, three years. Every three years? Okay. But, and but how did you arrive at three years? Because um, I think courses get outdated um, so quickly, but again, I would, you know, still recommend them updating everything um, each term, like articles, um, you know, make sure those are not outdated, case studies, things like that. Those um, particular things should be, I think, updated every term or make sure they're relevant so uh, students could um, be working on things or reading things that's definitely that they can relate to. Um, but um, three, I, and when I had worked, before at another institution, we did three to five years, but we found that five was a little bit too long. Um, so moved it down to three years. Great. Okay. Thanks, Lena. Mary, did you have any thoughts on that? I feel like, sorry, I have a hungry child. Um, I feel like it depends on the course and the course content, especially um, in nursing and with development in like the medical field, depending on the course. Um, it could be updated even yearly, depending on guidelines and when things come out, certain aspects of a course. Um, I feel like Lynette's on to something with three years, but I honestly feel like, and with my courses, I feel like I'm always revising something. Um, and I just haven't quite got the courses the way that I 100% love them. Um, so I feel like minor changes I'm doing every semester or yearly and then overhauling major content. Um, we're doing a lot of that now because we're transitioning everything to Blackboard um, uh, Ultra. So I feel like we're deep diving into all of our courses and revising those. But from this point forward, hopefully another three years, I would agree with Lynette on that. But it also, I feel like is subject and content related as well. Yes, I think that is an excellent point. And we do hear this a lot um, in relation to content. So um, I, I think we've heard, you know, somebody says, well, I, I'm teaching history. It's already happened. The, the content isn't going to change. Uh, but as an instructor, there are still these elements of your course that you can change. And so it's always interesting to hear what, what people think uh, needs to happen for course revisions. Thank you. So I thought I would 
take this moment to introduce QM. And um, it sounds like both of you know QM, but um, again, it stands for Quality Matters, and they are a nonprofit quality assurance program. NIU is a QM institution. And so I thought this would be kind of a, a unique spot to insert this little piece of information. When a course is QM certified, and that's definitely uh, a rigorous process, so I wouldn't recommend diving into that right away. Uh, it, we like to help our faculty try to prepare for this process. But it's this idea that three reviewers for a QM course review uh, will come in and they will evaluate your course and they're going to use this rubric to conduct the formal course review process. The rubric does continue to evolve um, and that's just to reflect and to keep up with industry changes in academia, but it's always trying to seek out uh, ways to address or to uphold best online teaching practices. And so I thought it was you know, important to note that QM certification lasts for five years. I just wanted to see, does that surprise you or good, bad, uh, it was? It does last for five years, but if certain thing changes, then it, do, it doesn't. Like say for instance, we switched learning management systems um, recently. And so that our courses are no longer certified if we switch um, management learning LMS. Um, and I think that's a bummer, but yeah, other than that, and you can also, you know, do a, I forgot what it's called, but a recertification for like another two years, but just by us moving to a new LMS, we have to recertify all our courses again. Yep. Correct. I always thought five years was generous, but you know, maybe that's just me. I am. But QM is a very rigorous process, so I have to admit, I, I don't know if I'd want to go through this every <laughs> every two years either. So, all right, I was just curious. I didn't know what everyone felt about it. So, all right, when we do look at the different types of assessment, um, and I know we've already kind of alluded to this, but there are three different forms of the assessment. There's, of course, the instructor or the self-assessment. And this is where you think about the changes that you want to make to your course. Um, and this is often governed by your knowledge of the field. Um, but also, if you've taught the course before, then you have an idea of maybe what worked well for your students or what needs adjustment. The other type of assessment is the student assessment piece. Now, you are the one designing the course, but you do want to incorporate their feedback. And so again, if you haven't already started doing this, we would at least recommend that somewhere towards the middle of the semester, you solicit feedback from your students and think of ways that you can incorporate that into your course. It can be as you know, thorough as you want, or it could just be a couple of simple questions, but you might want to ask your students things like, is the content of this course easy to navigate? Do you feel that there are elements that are missing or are there areas that we can expand upon? Are there things that you wish to see introduced into the course? Um, so this can help you make some of those changes that we talked about earlier uh, as you're kind of in that low grade um, course assessment uh, scenario where you're making changes as you go along. Your third option here is your peer or colleague assessment, and this can come up with asking a trusted colleague in your department. Maybe they've been there longer than you or a substantial amount of time, and they can give you some feedback based on your department standards. Or you could even ask um, another peer or colleague who is maybe not a field expert, and so they can give you an outside perspective on things that maybe would confuse them. Absolutely, and I agree with these things they're putting in the chat here. Content relevant, what's working well, what is not, yes. Can I ask a quick question in regards to the peer feedback? Because this is something that I honestly didn't really think about until now, and it's something that I haven't really seen done in the School of Nursing. Is there a format or a way or approach to doing um, peer feedback that you would recommend? Well, again, I think that every department is unique. So, um, you know, it could just be something informal, somebody who you trust. You can ask them to take a look at your course and to give you feedback. Is there anything they would change? Um, you know, are there things that they really like? Um, 
I do see Tracy has her hand up too. The other thing is sometimes uh, we have seen departments that will um, allow another instructor to um, come into their course. You know, they'll grant them access as an instructor to, to give them a look around, kind of a mentorship. Tracy? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to kind of mention, especially since uh, you folks have some experience with the Quality Matters Review, uh, you know, in in that case that, you know, there's a, a team of reviewers um, and they are experienced online teachers. So in that way, they're considered peers. But there's also always a subject matter expert involved in that. And so that's, you know, a, a more closely aligned peer. Uh, one of the interesting things about the early Quality Matters um, training that we did with the School of Nursing is that quite a few of um, the School of Nursing faculty have gone through the peer review course as well. Um, so th they're kind of um, at, the, at the forefront of being able to um, have their courses looked at for quality with, with a peer, with someone that's within the school. So it's kind of an, um, an interesting thing that nursing was kind of ahead of the curve in that way. I love that the, yes, so the subject matter expert was on my agenda of things to discuss, so I'm, I'm really excited that already came up. So yes, I, I think um, you could ask maybe in your department who is a um, QM peer reviewer. You could ask around and see who's who's already achieved that certification status, um, they'd probably be an excellent person to, to come in and to review your course. And you could add them, you know, after maybe a course has ended, as opposed to maybe while it's live, <laughs> that might be less stressful for you. So, and that's certainly something to, to think about, but you could enroll them um, as a course, um, course instructor so that they can view all of your content. Um, can I piggyback on that? Yes, um, please. Like you all said, also in our college of nursing, it's not, um, it's very common for us to have several instructors in our course because we have large enrollments of students, 70, 80. And so to break it up, they have several instructors in there. So before the course starts, we have, we might have a course leader um, that creates the course and make it. And so then she will meet with the other faculty members on a regular basis before the course open, you know, weeks before, and they get to go through the course together and talk about the courses and the assignments. So that's how they're getting their peer feedback from the mentor and um, about the course and what works, you know, what's working and what should be changed and things like that. So um, they meet with them several times, like I said, before the course and also during the course. And, during the course is to talk about other stuff like the grading and the rubrics and things like that. So they, they meet pretty regularly because it's several courts because it's several instructors. So they want them kind of all to like grade similar and et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Um, yes, again, some of these departments have what they consider a lead instructor and they might be the ones who develop the um, overall course design and then all of the other instructors will, will teach maybe according to that design. Um, but if that's not something that is in your department or that's not a model that you see present, you might consider asking around to see who else has taught your course. Tracy, did you have your hand up? I just left, left it lingering. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that happens. Okay. Um, so I think that's, unless there are any other questions, we can dive in to take a look at what are the quality essentials? Anything? So we do have kind of this blanket statement and quality essentials are derived from quality matters. But again, it is our, our commitment to course quality. So these are going to be the research-based standards that are used to design online and hybrid courses and to assess online course quality at NIU. So I know that's very generic, but we'll, we'll take a look at this specifically, what this means. All right, so 
Audie Matters has designed a rubric and within this rubric, they have eight different standards. And so that's what you see on the screen in front of you. These are the eight different uh, standards that, or different sections that they look at. And from there, I think it is, unless it's changed recently, they have 42 specific pieces of criteria. So every time that you opened one of these sections, you would see um, additional I call them bullet points, but um, additional little criterions. So that's a lot to look at. That's a, a lot to, to go through. And so quality essentials was derived from this. The quality essentials, we've pared down this list. We still kept all eight of the different standards, but um, instead of having 42 specific criteria, I think we have around 21 or 22. I, I have to check my math. I warned you I'm an English major at heart, so um, I'll have to double check. Um, but we we cut it in about half. And so these, you know, 20-ish uh, criterions uh, represent what we think are essential for our quality online or hybrid instruction, any course that has a strong digital presence. So for example, and please don't worry about uh, writing down the URL here. I am going to send you a follow-up email with a link to our recording as well as to a list of resources. And so I will link you to this checklist. But here's an example of what the Quality Essentials checklist looks like. We still have all of the different criteria that is outlined by QM. But the ones that we consider essential, as you can see there, are marked with the check mark. The other ones are what we consider exemplary standards. And so these are standards that we encourage, um, but they are not, not part of the quality essential uh, review. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. So what can we do with these quality essentials? Mm -hmm. well, we can plan and we can evaluate our courses with them, but we're going to take a look at what this looks like. So I want to start with, before we, we take a, a look at the quality essential standards, um, I kind of want to take a, a look at maybe what are the guiding principles behind them. So we start with the student perspective. And I know I have up here a screenshot of Blackboard Ultra, right? And student perspective goes beyond just a technical perspective here. Even though I've highlighted using the student perspective, I do think that is a, a best practice is once you have your online course or your hybrid course set up, you should browse it through it from the student perspective to make sure that everything that you want is visible. Uh, but going and approaching your course from the student perspective also means thinking about how you want to present your content. And a lot of this deals with thinking about how you want your students to interact with your course. As a general rule of thumb, I would recommend that you think about this in a chronological order. So as you can see here, I think it's big enough of a screenshot. It starts with a welcome page, your instructor, syllabus and course information, and then student support. If I wanted my students to enter my course, then I would anticipate them going through the content in this order. So that's part of part of quality essentials here is thinking about our course from the student perspective. We're, we're trying to create a student centric learning environment. The other idea here is to focus on learning objectives. Now, since both of you have interacted with QM, you may already be aware of this, but they, uh, they do ask you, if you ever go for a formal QM course review, uh, they will ask you, are, are your learning objectives for the course uh, department mandated? And if they are department mandated, then you might not be able to change them. And, they understand that, um, but they still think that as an instructor, you have a lot of control over different types of learning objectives. So you could have learning objectives at the 
unit level or the module level. So if you have a 16 week course, you might have 16 different sets of learning objectives. What do you want your students to accomplish each week of the course? And so that again, um, you can even further refine it and you could also do it at the assessment level or the assignment level. Why are you, why are you doing this? You know, you, you can try to think about this from the student perspective again. Why are you engaging in this type of activity? And so I've put four different uh, hints here about learning objectives, whether you're thinking at, about it at the course level, if you're thinking about it at the unit level, or even at the assignment or the assessment level. And we're going to have a fun little activity for us here. So um, one of the things that we encourage when you are writing strong learning objectives is to use action verbs. You also may want to try to write them from the student perspective. So by the end of this week, I will, and what, what are you going to do if you put yourself in the student's shoes? You also want to ensure that they are measurable. So if you're wondering, what does that mean? How, how do I make sure that something is measurable? Look for some type of activity that you can observe. You know, what are your students going to do? Um, how, how can I prove that they have actually met this, this objective? So um, look for physical evidence of, of some sort of behavior that you can, that you can evaluate. And the fourth one here is to try to connect them to activities and assessments. And again, this might be more optional than the, the top three uh, different standards I put up there. Uh, this might deal with mapping and showing how specific activities connect to overall learning objectives, uh, but it's always something good to aspire towards. So. I thought this would be a, a fun time just to, to get your mind whirling here. I, I don't know why I love this little cartoon picture so much, but I do. Uh, so this is our brainstorm. And maybe I should have said, um, go ahead, I'm gonna let you type in the chat. Um, let me know which list is which, but the first list is to brainstorm a list of action verbs suitable for learning objectives. What comes to mind? And then the second part to this is to, brain, to brainstorm a list of words or terms that are difficult to measure in your learning objectives. So if you've ever seen a, a weak learning objective, what does that look like? <laughs> Thanks, Lynette. So I'm gonna let you, let you play with this. I think it's a good exercise. I think this dictates a lot of what QM and also Quality Essentials looks for. Wonderful. Okay, I see some stuff coming in here. So Tracy says that describe and analyze are good terms. And he says to demonstrate, to exhibit, or apply. Wonderful. I think there, there's a lot of different words that we could use here. Um, Mary has planned to utilize, to formulate. Absolutely, to discuss, create, evaluate, any of these I, I think are good um, objectives to start with. So what about the more difficult ones, things that are, are harder to assess? Ah, 
to know this. I see that one frequently or to understand. And Tracy also said to appreciate or to learn. Those are hard to measure, to interpret. Absolutely. We, we don't really always know what's going on inside our students' minds. I'm not saying we don't want them to understand or to learn, uh, but we would have a harder time assessing that and truly evaluating it, say, on a grading rubric. Great. All right, so my third um, guiding principle, I think it's my final one for this section, um, is this idea of facilitating interaction with your students. And this is also a major theme for, again, both QM and Quality Essentials. Uh, but there are three different types of interaction that we can facilitate. So there is this interaction between the student and the instructor. And I always like to refer to this idea of set it and forget it, which is what we want to avoid. Um, so you can't just necessarily say, I'm going to post a welcome video to the course, and then I'm not going to interact with my students again, really, for the duration of the, of the course. Uh, facilitating interaction in all three of these groups is something that is ongoing and is present throughout the duration of your class. So you do want to make sure that you are interacting with your student um, throughout your class. You're going to want to probably have different forms of interaction with your student. The second group here is interaction with peers. And that's where you are asking the students to get to know one another, maybe to work collaboratively on a project or an activity. And the third one is this idea that you need to facilitate interaction with your students and your course content. And again, there is an emphasis here on variation in all three of these kind of categories. If the instructor and student interactions, you want to think of different ways that you can communicate. If you have students who are interacting amongst one another, um, how do they do that? What are the different forms in which they get to, to work with each other? And again, for content, we want to think of different types of content that we can introduce into our course, whether that's text or audio or video um, or just a variety of resources, maybe from different authors. So. At which point you may be wondering, well, how do I how do I add all these elements into my course? And so I would say you might want to utilize your resources that are readily available. And I have two of them for you. Again, I will follow up with an email to you uh, with these links. One of the first resources that I wanted to bring to your attention is this idea that you can request a Blackboard course template. So the Blackboard course template, if you have not heard of it, is highly customizable. Lynette loves templates, excellent. So we have created a template for you that is not field or discipline specific. It's just a method of organization. And it often, well, it does exemplify um, our best teaching practices, but it often meets a lot of the criteria that is outlined by Quality Essentials. So it is, again, fully customizable. So if you have a slightly different order or sequence to your course, of course, you can change things. If you have additional content that you want to bring in, you can add to the list that's already provided. Uh, but it is a nice outline for anybody who is starting to build their online course. Um, so you can request this from the CIDL department, but as you can see on the screen here, it has things like a welcome page, and we've included placeholders for important information, placeholders for where you might put a schedule, a placeholder where you might put um, your syllabus, a placeholder where you might put a, a welcome message from the instructor, that type of a thing. It also has some links to resources for your students, which again is an excellent place to start. And if you have additional resources that you want your students to have access to, you can just kind of keep growing this list. Lynette says, by customizing, do you find that a course may lose the quality essentials? 
I suppose if you customized it and you deleted a lot of information, it's possible. Um, but I think most people will look at it as an opportunity to add to as opposed to delete. But you know what? Anything is possible. So um, one of the resources, Lynette, that we have in there is um, it gives student resources. And um, I, I don't know if you've looked at it at all, but it does point to uh, Blackboard Assist, which is a great place to send our students for a variety of the things that you're listing there, um, such as like to the Writing Center or things of that nature. But certainly you can continue to update it and add to it. I think during the pandemic, I, I had an instructor who was making sure to include resources about where to uh, where to find free mobile hotspots. Or, you know, I think there was information about a food pantry and, and just making sure that their students basic needs were met. So, um, you know, in that sense, I, I certainly don't think that you would detract from the quality essential standards. But, um, you know, I guess if you deleted everything, well, it could happen. Did that answer your question? Okay. The um, other resource that I wanted to highlight is we have a page that's devoted to regular and substantive interaction. And this is a federal requirement for online courses. And we do receive a lot of questions about this. You know, what does it mean to have regular and substantive interaction with my students? But um, I, I really do love this web page. There's just a lot of information and very practical tips in here. So they talk about what does it mean to have frequent and consistent communication with students? And they, again, give you some very specific tips on what you can do and how you can reach out to your students um, and how you can meet this requirement. So I definitely would take a look at this. Some of these things, it sounds like you're already doing in your courses, but it might give you a couple of ideas for something new you could try. Great, and Lynette says, we've put this section in our syllabus template and have check boxes on what is used in your course um, that instructors have to check. Excellent, I love that. So um, I've, I've heard some people are, are very worried about this and they think that they have to respond to every single student's discussion board response. And as you well know, if you have a large course, that's probably not feasible. So, um, but there are other ways to communicate with your students. And so that's addressed in here. Okay. We are breezing right along. So um, I think we're probably going to have about 10 minutes for Q&A or we can get out early. But I did want to surprise you with some things that are coming soon. So we are developing our own NIU internal quality essentials course review. I know you're very excited. You can feel the fireworks. So let me talk a little bit about what this is going to look like. You can sign up to have your course reviewed by one of our reviewers, which will probably be a CITL staff member, according to the Quality Essentials Checklist. So Quality Essentials, um, again, we've tried to simplify this from the QM checklist. Um, we, again, we, we cut some of their criteria in half. So we have about 50% of it that we marked as essentials. And again, the other 50%, I think we called it exemplary. So you are going to want to make sure that you meet all of the criteria that is marked as essential. And that's how you would get the quality essential uh, certification here. But to let you know a little bit about what this is going to look like from the instructor perspective is um, if you decide you want to, to try the quality essential course review process, it starts with uh, filling out kind of a profile as well as um, a self-assessment of your of your course. And so it's going to be a combination of saying, yes, I think I have this criteria in my course. It might be, again, like a checklist. And then there's going to be opportunities for you to maybe in a short answer, talk a little bit about your unique course design and where we can expect to find certain pieces of your course. Um, 
Lynette, I will get to your question here in just a moment. Um, once you've finished your own self-assessment piece, then that's where you get to invite a reviewer to tour your course and to review your assessment. And the course reviewer is only going to use the quality essentials checklist. Um, and so they're going to determine if you've met all of this criteria and then you will receive customized feedback. And I haven't forgotten about you, Lynette. I'll get to you in just a moment. So again, I just wanted to provide you with an example of what this could look like. So again, remember the QM had eight different standards, which we've still kept. So one of the standards is assessment and measurement. And so these are the different uh, four components that we have deemed essential. So we would be looking for maybe you know, all four of these pieces in your course. The exemplary, again, is optional or encouraged, but not required. Okay. And then what would happen? So if you, um, if you complete the Quality Essentials course review and pass, and don't worry if you, if you end up, you did not meet all of the criteria on the first go round, you can have it re-reviewed after you revise. Uh, but these are, again, more details to come, but we're looking at some public recognition for your hard work on your outstanding course design and your course quality. We're looking at some micro-credentials, think like a badge. We are letting instructors know that this is something they can include if they're part of the tenure review process. You know, what, what are your accomplishments? What have you done? Uh, this is a great thing to include kind of on your resume. And then we also look at it as preparation for the QM course review and other types of assessments. And so I think we also have the Blackboard Exemplary Course Program Review. Um, and, and so there, you know, there are benchmarks. You can continue to get recognition for all of your outstanding course quality um, commitments. And Lynette, I didn't mean to um, cut you off there. So I, I wasn't sure about your question. Would you mind coming on the mic? And if you can clarify that. I was just saying we have, um, you know, some similar things that's going on here. And I was just wondering, like, say, for instance, when we review a course and you know how you um, say what meets or not or, you know, and put recommendations because anything that doesn't meet, you definitely have to put a um, comment and a recommendation on what how, you know, what can be done to make it meet the standards. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, after it's reviewed, all action may not be taken in the course. And I was just, you know, wondering, you know, if the action is not taken, you know, is there any, you know, any, what happens or, you know, they just like don't get the badge or stuff like that. Or... I think Tracy's jumping here, so I'm going to let her. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> No, sorry. Um, you know, there's there's many different ways that you could meet these standards. And so, you know, having done the reviews both um, informally and for QM, um, I, you know, sometimes there's that recommendation of, you know, you may want to create a course tour of your course so that students understand the navigation. Well, if you decide not to do that, that's that's fine. You know, you could still meet the standards. You may just do it in a different way. So maybe instead of a video course tour, you're just going to do some step by step instructions on how the course is outlined, you know, so there are different ways to do different, you know, to kind of meet these standards. So it's not that you absolutely have to do what's recommended. Um, and you can, you can take the recommendations, improve your course over time, and, you know, let it stay like that. But I will say that if you're going on to further, um, you know, either a quality matters recognition, or a Blackboard exemplary course, recognition, those folks, that's what they're going to be looking at. And so that's why we're sort of doing our best to prepare you to go to the next level. So does that, that make sense? Like, it's not that you have to take every single recommendation 
Um, and certainly there can be some back and forth about, oh, well, this is how I meet that recommendation, you know? So the, it's definitely that process where it's just, um, you know, when we're talking about the quality essential reviews, um, it's very much a, a back and forth and, hey, try this, you know, and it all works out. So I'm glad it's making sense for you, Lynette. And just to add to what Tracy said, um, part of how we came up with quality essentials when we decided how we were going to pare down the list of QM criteria is we looked at things that might be what we consider, um, you know, something that needs to be reviewed by a subject matter expert. And in those, in those instances, we listed them as exemplary standards. Um, we tried to keep the ones that were a little bit, you know, less subjective as the essentials. So I, I just have a question about like, when does it start or when should we look out for this? Because I'd love to do this for um, a couple of my classes and have them reviewed. Um, so what is the timeline, I guess, to be I mean, able to Coming soon, our goal, which I know we always say our goal, maybe, you know, maybe nothing is ever set in stone, uh, but we hope to have this um, out in October. October, okay, all right, perfect, thank you. That'd be great. So we're, we're working hard to, to get that rollout process going, um, barring unforeseen circumstances. We, we believe that is the timeline though. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So I think we've got about seven minutes to spare, and so we can do additional Q&A, or I can give you back a couple minutes of your day. But thank you again for attending, and I'll stop the recording.